This is One on One. The public television family and our Fios family is also pleased to welcome Dan Harris, author of Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics and also 10% Happier and also co-anchor of Nightline on ABC News. Good to see right you. Right across the street. Right across right the street. Across right across the street. It is right Long there. commute. Thank you for coming <laughs> over. Um, I'm fascinated by your work. I'm a fan. But I'm also fascinated by your candor. One of the first things you talk about, and I, I read in the book, was the experience, I believe, in 2004 that you had. And I encourage folks to go online, check it out. You literally had a panic attack on the air. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for jumping right into it. No, go for it. And I've had my own experiences. Oh, you have? Yes. With panic? It didn't manifest itself exactly like yours. Mine was a whole sweating thing because uh -huh. I thought a room was too close in it. Whatever. Either way, it doesn't look good. It didn't feel good. And the fact that you put it out there, wrote about it, said it, and then did a report, what is the connection between that panic attack that you experienced, network, national television, and the whole meditation thing? It set me off on a weird and windy journey that ultimately led me to meditation. It was sort of, as, as they say in the movie business, the inciting event. Mm -hmm. So I, I had the panic attack in 2004 um, on Good Morning America. I was reading the headline. Charlie Gibson was there, right? And Charlie Diane Gibson Sawyer. and Diane Sawyer were on the set. Uh, we were in Times Square, and I was doing my thing, reading some stories off of the teleprompter. I was looking right. into the camera, reading some stories, and I just lost it. I just couldn't breathe anymore. My lungs seized up, my heart was racing, my, pal my, my palms were sweaty, and um, I said I had a bail right in the middle. You did, you just stopped. I just stopped. But more embarrassing than that was actually what caused it. Well, what caused it was some very dumb behavior in my personal life. I had, I had arrived at ABC News, again, right across the street in 2000, the year 2000. I was 28 years old and I was really ambitious and You idealistic. made it, by that way. You, you had, I, finally, I you did, you're like at I, the dance. Except I got, to ABC and I realized I hadn't quite made it because I needed to compete with and, and, and hold my own in an environment where I'm working with Diane Sawyer, Barbara Walters, Peter Jennings, who was, became my mentor. And then not long after I arrived at ABC News, there was this huge event, which was 9-11. And I ended up going overseas and covering you know, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Israel, the West Bank, Gaza. I was in Iraq many, many times. And I came home from a really long run in Iraq and I got depressed and I didn't even know I was depressed. I was insufficiently self-aware. And I did a really, as I said before, sort of dumb thing. I started to self-medicate with recreational drugs, including cocaine. And even though I was never doing it when I was working and I, I never got high on the air, after I had the panic attack, I went to a doctor who pointed out that my drug use was enough uh, that it artificially raised the level of adrenaline in my brain and primed me to have the panic attack. So when I put all that together, that's what kind of set me off toward finding meditation. It took a while, but it was what set me off. Let's talk about meditation. The other irony for, the, for me is that we're, we happen to be taping uh, <clears throat> for the back end of February. And yesterday, I was doing a yoga session with this instructor who's fabulous. And toward the end, I had to move and get out of there. And she said, can we do some <clears throat> excuse me, meditation? I literally said, and I'm reading your book, I said, sorry, I don't have time. <laughs> I've got to get out of here. I've got to prep for taping tomorrow. I'm not making any of this up. Yeah, I believe you. And I got out. And she goes, no, I'm serious. You could use this. And I said, I know, but it's like too hard to. A lot of what I just said, multiplied by millions of others who think I can't, I don't have the time, help us. So there are two. In the book, I uh, wanted to sort of figure out what is stopping people who want to meditate from actually doing it. I don't proselytize to people who aren't interested because that's just- but Say you want to, I yes. want to, millions right. of others want to. I would say the two biggest obstacles that we found and that we give you workarounds for, uh, one is what you said, not having the time. So the, the good, I have good news and better news. The good news is that I think five to 10 minutes a day is a really healthy habit and ought to be enough, according to the scientists with whom I've spoken, to derive many of the advertised benefits. You know, Such si as? Science suggests that meditation can lower your blood pressure, boost your immune system, <clears throat> and literally rewire key parts of the brain that have to do with focus, mm -hmm. have to do with self-awareness, compassion, uh, emotional regulation. So these are benefits that many people, I would say, almost everybody would like to have. Uh, and so I, I think five to 10 minutes a day is enough to, to, to get a significant taste of this. But if you feel like five to 10 minutes a day is too much, I think one minute counts. And I think one minute most days count. 
Why? Because what you're doing in meditation is just waking up to a fundamental fact that is often overlooked. It's gonna sound incredibly obvious when I say it, but most people are not in touch with it. We have a mind and we're thinking, but we're unaware of this nonstop conversation we're having with ourselves. Not a healthy one. It's mostly negative. It's all self-referential. It's incredibly repetitive. And it, when you're unaware of this nonstop conversation, it yanks you around. It's why you, you put your hand in the fridge when you're not hungry, or you lose your temper when it makes no sense, or you're checking your email in the middle of a conversation with somebody else. And in my case, being unaware of my inner conversation sent me off to war zones without thinking about the consequences. I came home, was insufficiently self-aware to know I was depressed, and then I blindly self-medicated. And so that kind of brings it full circle. And this can happen in a minute. Waking up, disembedding from the various trances in which we operate, the trance of unworthiness, the trance of insufficiency, the trance of gotta get it done, gotta get it done, or I'm gonna somehow explode. Right. All of these things, you can step out of the traffic of your inner conversation and see it clearly and not be so owned by it. The other obstacle people face is they feel like, I can't clear my mind. I can't do this. And I was picking that up from what you were saying. You don't understand. It's hard. I'm so busy. Well, so here's more good news. It is impossible to clear your mind. You can only clear your mind if you're enlightened or you're dead. <laughs> the mind's job is to produce thoughts just the way the stomach's job is to produce enzymes. And so the point is not to clear your mind, which again is impossible. The point is to, is to notice when you've become distracted and to start again and again and again. And over and over you just see, oh, I've been carried away. I was trying to focus on my breath, but I got distracted, so I start again and again. Is it muscle memory? It's a bicep curl for your brain. Every time you see you're distracted and start again, you are changing your brain. And this is what shows up on the brain scans. You're teaching yourself two big things. One, how to stay on target, how to stay on task, which is very hard to do in this era that's been described as the info blitzkrieg. The other thing you're teaching yourself is to not take your inner dialogue so seriously. And when you see how crazy you are, in that moment when you wake up from distraction, when most people think they've failed at meditation, that's actually a victory because you're seeing how nutty your inner zoo is. And when you see that, it has less of a chance of owning you. Now I'm done talking. You got me thinking so many things. <clears throat> One of them is, you were on a cross country tour. Yes. Who'd you speak to? So I wanted to write a how to meditate book, but I also, Realize there are a lot of them out there and I wanted to make one that wasn't boring. So I decided to structure it as a story. One of the things I've learned at ABC News is how to tell stories visually. So we got a really ridiculous big orange tour bus. We put big 10% happier decals on the side of it. We recruited a, an amazing meditation teacher and we went to 18 states in 11 days, which is fast to cross the country. By the way, this bus, the previous occupants were uh, Parliament Funkadelic. Uh, <laughs> the the band. The, the fun, band? Yes, Parliament for Yes, George Clinton's band. That's I'm pretty wild. sure we were the most boring people ever to occupy I'm the bus. I'm confident that's true. So we met with celebrities, cops, social workers, politicians, um, uh, formerly incarcerated youth. You had a member of Congress who was like, I'm sorry, yep. I remember reading the book. It was like, are you kidding me? Why can't we spend a couple minutes to do this with Absolutely. all the BS we're dealing with down Absolutely. here? Absolutely. Uh, Elvis Duran, who we had right here, Elvis Duran. Elvis Duran used to have a little bit of a temper, dare I say, mm -hmm. and? He started to meditate and it's gotten a lot better. And so we just met all, just in a, a wide variety of people and we really did a taxonomy of all of the obstacles that stop people who wanna meditate from actually doing the thing. Mm. And we developed a bunch of tips to help you get over it. And in the process, we also teach you how to meditate. What's it done for you? Teaching and, 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 and motivating and helping others? I, it has changed my life in a, in a massive way. Um, I was, I wouldn't say I was a miserable guy, but I was really stressed. There was no, I had no, di there was so much churn in me, so much ambition uh, and so much frustration when things didn't go my way. And I was- Is there a club we're in? But go ahead. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Even it's when you're older, uncommon. it's still there, but go ahead. I'm sure, I'm sure. And I still have some of that. But what I've learned how to do is I'm still very ambitious, man. I still, I, I'm writing books. I you have a podcast. I, I have a podcast. I have a company. We where, put up the podcast for people who know how to get it. Go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I have a, a startup company that teaches people how to meditate through an app. I anchor two shows at ABC News. I'm still very ambitious. How are you managing that stress with all that stuff? It's, uh, I, I married very well. And uh, I also, you know, meditation, exercise, getting enough sleep, eating well, taking care of myself helps me sort of do what I need to do without going crazy. But that's, that's not to say that I never mm. get run down, that I have elite, you know, that I have absolutely um, destroyed my capacity to be a schmuck. It's still there. 
but I'm less so than I used to be. And what I've found is that, yes, it's true that certain amount of stress and striving and plotting and planning is necessary in order to get done what you need to get done. We tend to make our suffering worse than it needs to be. Mm. What meditation helps me do is draw the line between useless rumination and what I call constructive anguish. And that has made a huge difference. Before I let you out of here, by the way, um, Dan Harris, uh, it is meditation for fidgety skeptics. New York, uh, one, excuse me, number one New York Times best selling author. Um, real quick on this, also 10% uh, happier. I don't want to do the Pandora's box. It gets open, we can't close it. <laughs> President Trump and meditation, mm -hmm. do you see it? Uh, you know, possibility for if, if he's interested, he should give me a call uh, or hit me up on Twitter um, uh, because I would love to talk to him about it or anybody in his administration or anybody in the Democratic leadership. I think that we need more mindfulness in Washington. I don't think that's a controversial assertion. Uh, I think people need to be able to step out of the stories they're telling themselves and their habitual patterns of behavior and to try something new. And I think meditation is not a panacea, but could be useful. Anybody who's interested, including the president, I'd be happy to talk. Cameron, thank you for joining us, coming thank across you. the street to be with us <laughs> at public television. We wish you nothing but the best, thank and uh, I have a feeling a whole bunch of folks, me included, they're gonna go back and try again. Thank you. Thank you, stay Pleasure with to me. meet you, thank you. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Summit Medical Group, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, United Airlines, the Northward Center, New Jersey Sharing Network, Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey, and by Choose New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.